All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bow Hunter Chronicles podcast. And I don't know, um, when I first started getting into saddle hunting and, you know, there was a few companies on the market and there was a name that just kept popping up, kept popping up. And then, you know, not too long after that, it was like, oh, this guy's kind of an asshole, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, kind of steer clear of them industry all this stuff surrounding him and um so so this has been a long time coming for uh this podcast and uh you know it's a great conversation i think we're gonna have here not just on the product side of it or industry side of it but like kind of a, a background and his background into hunting i think we can probably uh learn a little bit um from from this guy so uh we got andrew walter from uh wild edge so <laughs> what do you think of the intro there uh andrew <laughs> i love it that's perfect <laughs> so how are you doing today how's things over there in connecticut good just got back from a good fishing trip went out with my buddies so we uh were at the boat at three this morning caught a really nice keepers two keepers and a really nice striper a big 40 incher so yeah, i guess yep. that's what you got to do with your day but for me, you can keep the fishing out. <laughs> I'll find something else to do. So, like, what is your, you got a pretty interesting background when it comes to, like, I guess, killing deer. Um, but your hunting background, where did that start? Like, when you first started out, like, what's, what was your style of hunting or how were you introduced to the sport? Uh, my dad was, uh, I grew up, my dad was a bow hunter. Um, he didn't start till college. Um, so I was brought up bow hunting, but you know, he'd only bow hunt. He'd go to our cabin in Pennsylvania once a year. So started bringing me when I was about 10, but I was always in the woods. Um, and then obviously counting down the days until I was 12 years old and could legally hunt. And, uh, you know, I went from you know, growing up with my dad who was, he was into it, but not serious, uh, not a hardcore bow hunter. Um, so I took it to the next level, just instantly got obsessed. Um, killed my first deer when I was 13 with a bow, and then from there on, it was just pure addiction. Uh, so just lived in the woods, killed everything. You know, the rule growing up was you kill it, you eat it. So we ate a lot of squirrel, <laughs> you know, rabbits, everything. So, you know, that progressed into um, actually a career in um, wildlife biology. So. Right out of college, I got a job working as a wildlife biologist or sharpshooter. So I traveled all around the country and the world, uh, doing suburban deer management, island conservation, eradication projects. So that was really cool. Um, so, you know, kind of spun that, went from that to, uh, I was doing that while I was in the army. And then really got, I wanted to settle down, wanted to have a family on my little farm, on a dog, kid. So that I couldn't have that life with that career, living in a hotel all around the world for eight months out of the year. So that's when I, I had known Jim Stepp, the inventor of the step ladder since I was 14. So I was talking to him about, you know, how I wanted to stay more close to home. And that's when he gave me the idea of bringing the step ladder back to life. You know, cause when he was selling them, it was before the internet back in the early nineties. And it was, uh, he was selling that Kittery Trading Post, L.O. Bean, you know, any story to get into. So I, you know, one day just shook his hand and kind of rolled with it. And here we are today. So when you started hunting, like you're from learning from your dad, right? So what, what was your, you know, now everything is saddle hunting, you know, super lightweight mobile setups. And yep. before that it was climber it was you know the lone wolves and the you know the the lighter you know quote unquote lighter at that time you know setups and and moving around um so like how did you start out what was your dad's style of hunting and then where did you take it it was funny it was always you know you go into the woods take your lock on your screw in steps find a tree it was always you know on a heavy trail set it up and that's where you hunted for the week you know you may you may move it a couple times during the week or throughout the season but you know it's pretty basic but i can remember you know dad setting a stand up sitting in it and then seeing deer like you know 50 60 100 yards off and i'd be like you know f this 
I'd get down from my stand, take my boots off, and I'd still hunt, stalk deer, and kill them. So I, you know, I killed more deer on the ground growing up than I did out of a tree. Uh, so I got addicted to still hunting with a recurve, compound, gun, you know, any weapon I could get my hands on. Small game, large game. So I was, I was pretty much always on the ground. Um, I couldn't sit still. You know, I'd sit in the tree for first light, maybe last half hour to an hour, and then I'd be on the ground. Whether it was raining or whether it was loud, you know, either way, I'm, I was still hunting. So that progressed into, you know, obviously learning a ton. I was pretty much on my own. Um, you know, by the age I was, by the time I was 15, 16, I was setting up stands for my dad, you know, dragging him into the woods. So then, you know, that progressed into my buddies and I getting into filming hunts. So, you know, we would have, you know, as many steps as Jim gave us, we had, we had screwing steps, we had sticks, ladders, branches, you name it. And then when we got into filming, we're trying to figure out how we could afford to have multiple tree stands in a tree you know, like the cheap $30 Walmart stands. And that's when I started looking at saddle hunting. My buddy had an old Anderson tree sling. So I borrowed that a couple of times and that turned into a bought an arborist saddle, turned that into a hunting saddle. And then from there on, I was like, self filming is the way to go, you know? So, or when I was filming another guy, I'd be up, up above them in the saddle or vice versa. So it, Turned into, you know, the still hunting on the ground, stock animals turned into the mobile hunting. But, you know, I still have at least 20, 30 presets in my hunting areas around here. But I may only sit those, you know, once, twice a year. I'm pretty much always mobile. So we've got a lot of guys. And one of the things, like, I have a goal to, like, kill a deer on the ground with a bow. And I've not done that. I've also not really put a lot of effort into it you know what i mean like i always go out with my same setup i don't i don't go out and say okay i'm gonna just hunt from the ground today i mean i've i did that like maybe a handful of times last year and got close but you know it's one of those things where i think you have to commit to doing it like when i went from a um hunting with my lone wolf climber that i loved to stand in sticks like i sold the climber because i knew i would go back to it right so like I, I had to fully commit and that's the way that I did it. So like, what are some of those things that you think guys make a mistake or like, what are some of the main things that you learned hunting on the ground to help you be successful in that way? Uh, biggest thing is I always, I get a lot of questions, guys, you know, how long does it take you to set up? You know, what's your time? What's your weight? How fast can you set up? Well, you know, they're all worried about time, weight, this, this, that. And, my response is, you know, obviously it's situational, depending on the tree, the time of year, the terrain, but mainly it's, I'm not running to my tree to go hunting. I'm literally still hunting my way in, whether I'm going to climb a tree or not, whether I'm scouting it as I hunt and may find a tree and be like, the sign's so good here, so hot, I got to jump up. Um, but it's, you know, it's mainly just, I'm hunting the entire way from the second I step out of my truck. I'm hunting. I don't care if I'm walking down a main road, you know, I'm still paying attention. Um, so, and you learn so much more being on the ground, being eye level with deer, you know, and moving around. And obviously 90% of the time you're screwing up, but it's paying attention to the small detail, looking for, you know, looking for those horizontal angles. You know, you're not just looking for a deer, you're looking for the back of the deer, you're looking for an ear, you're looking for a little flick of a tail or just leg sticking out. So it's, I learned so much just, creeping up on deer it was it was always a blast and you can't get bored moving around but it the hardest part is you know people think still hunting and they'll cover 100 yards in you know 10 15 minutes you're going 100 yards in you know thick terrain it should take you you know a good hour it's funny that you mentioned that i mean everybody the the still hunting aspect of it to me is that's the most difficult part because it's like if i can see from here to there you know say i can see 50 yards like seems like i'm I uh, naturally going to just move up to the next tree give it a couple seconds and not give it a minute or whatever um i think that that's probably the most difficult thing for most guys but it's funny that you say that about like the little things that was what i was going to ask you is like what are the little things that you notice 
But when you say that you're looking for, for different, you know, things in the woods, that horizontal thing. Like last night I was driving around with my daughter glassing and I'm like, I'm like, Hey, look, there's turkeys up there on the road. There's deer way back there. And she's like, how can you see so far without binoculars? And it's like, I'm not looking for deer. I'm just looking for something out of place. You know, like that doesn't, that doesn't look right. And it's funny. You walk, as you're walking through the woods, you know, if you, every step you take is a different scenario. It's a different view. Every single step you take, whether it's a six inch step or whether it's a three foot step, your whole visual changes of what you're seeing in the woods. So if you're cruising, you're walking, you know, 20 yards in 30 seconds, you're walking by a lot of stuff or you're always, the hardest part is you're focused on looking ahead, looking at your feet. So you're not stepping on stuff, making noise, but you're also looking ahead. So like when it's really loud out, you know, crunchy leaves, I literally will yelp like a turkey. And as I'm walking scratch, so I'm yelping with my mouth or, you know, when there's a lot of squirrels around, I'll walk like a squirrel. So I'll literally drag my feet and then stop and then move my feet around, stop. So I'm making a ton of noise, but you're walking up on squirrels, you know, five feet from you because they think you're another squirrel coming. Like uh, two years ago, I knew this buck was bedded up on this ridge. He had been there all summer. He was five and a half years old, so his home area just shrunk. He was just living right there. And I was so concerned opening day. I was like, I don't know how in the world I can get there. So I was playing with the wind. I accessed a little 50 acre piece. I accessed from the south side, the wind was screwy. So I backtracked, tried another access, the wind was screwy. Finally went all around and it just seemed like the stupidest way to access it. But, and it was so loud and so calm. But I was just like, you know, screw it. Just walk just like a squirrel. I made an obnoxious amount of noise. But the second I got to my tree, you know, it probably took me a good 20, 30 minutes to get set up. I was going so slow. So I knew that that dude was right there. Community scrape right there. Um, I had a salt stump that I'd been soaking for over 10 years. Um, he was hitting that regularly. He was just shedding his velvet. Literally five minutes after I'm, I, I was set up. I saw him 50 yards away, stand up and start rubbing a tree. It was, if I just walked in like a normal human, there's no way in hell he would have been there. So in, in that scenario, it, it just seems like completely ridiculous. Like, and you know, that Dan Infall says, you know, dating the fat chick, all that sitting by the road, doing things that you wouldn't tell your buddies about. Like, you know, I just... I, th I think of like a couple of different things. I think of a, if you would have just, I mean, I, I, I picture you just kind of hopping through the woods, like you're pretending you're the Easter bunny <laughs> to, to, to some degree. And then if there was another hunter or somebody saw you, you'd be like, what in the world is this guy doing? Yeah. But then the other side of that is like, how do you, uh, I don't know, like in the buck bedding world and, you know, in the hunting world, even in general, like, there's so many times where you go out and you don't see anything like what, what aside from that, huh? Was there like, what was the first time you tried that and that it was successful or like, how does that enter your mind? Cause it just seems like, you know, people say think outside of the box or like whatever, but that's, that, that's kind of out there. I'd say. Yeah, I mean, it's, if you, if you ask any one of my buddies, they know if it's raining out, I don't care if it's torrential rain, thunderstorm, or it's just drizzling, they know I'm in the woods. If it's a bright, sunny, beautiful bluebird day, they're like, they don't know if I'm in the woods. If it's raining, I'm in the woods. Because, I mean, your sense controlled. It's quiet. It's, you know, it's the time to still hunt. A nice, drizzly rain, leaves are soaked. I mean, it's just almost foolproof. Um, but then, you know, as I was younger, I was like, well, it's not always raining out. It's not always quiet. During the fall, the woods are always obnoxiously loud and just watching animals. You know, you watch a freaking squirrel go through the woods, you're like, you're convinced it's a 200 pound buck coming. Like, no, it's a little half a pound squirrel. You know, they're making a ruckus. So I guess, I don't know when it dawned on me, but it did. Um, and then just watching hunting shows, you know, growing up, I have every freaking jury outdoors video you could ever imagine, real tree. And I remember watching, uh, I think it was, um, uh, what is, or whatever his name is, having a brain fart. Um, he was stalking an animal and it was super loud and he took his boots off. So I remember I was like, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. I'm like, 
I was up on a ridge. I had my gun. And I couldn't get a shot. There was a bunch of does down this massive ridge. And I was like, well, look down. Like, it's super loud, but take my boots off. So I did. And I ended up stalking in. I probably went 100 yards to get, you know, close enough for a 50-yard shot. It was so thick. But I can remember it was just so much easier to feel your feet and what you're stepping on. You know, it brings you back to being primitive. I mean, you can feel so much. You step on a stick and it's like, oh, you stop. Pick your foot up. You know, you're rolling your feet until you feel what you're stepping on. Um, I, I remember that because I actually, it took me longer to find my boots than to drag the deer out. <laughs> totally forgot where I left them. But I mean, from then on, it was, that's, I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's easy. And, you know, walking like a squirrel, walking like a turkey. The only problem with if walking like a turkey, if, if there's a lot of turkeys in the area, if you call any in and then they spook, you know, it could ruin your hunt. But, I mean, you can't really mess up walking like a squirrel. Just literally shuffle your feet, stop. Shuffle your feet, stop. But, yeah, you feel kind of stupid. But So then, like, fast forward and said that you're like a wildlife biologist, right? So... When I think, I, I just think back to like high school or like even like trying to figure out what you're trying to do in college, right? Like a wildlife biologist, I think like, oh, you're taking fish samples and you're looking for E. coli and you're going out there and you're saving the monarch butterflies and doing all this like hippie stuff. Like, I don't remember seeing like go out and just murder deer all night for eight months out of the year. So like how, like how did all of that come about? It was, uh, I grew up working on a farm right next door to my house since I was like, since I was old enough to pick up a hay bale. Um, and then that farmer knew a friend who owned this company that did this contracting for suburban deer management. And so I just started hanging out with him since I was a you know, 14, 15 year old kid. And that turned in, you know, I'd work for him in the summer. I'd work for him. He'd, you know, when I was in college, I'd convince my professors to give me you know, a couple of weeks off so I could go work on this project that counted towards my credits. So it was a, I was, I basically had the job lined up before I got out of college. Um, so I was told I needed the wildlife biology degree because, you know, there's a lot of science that goes behind killing deer in such a um, sensitive area. I mean, when I say we're sharpshooting deer, we're shooting suppressed 223s with tack lights or night vision, thermal scopes at night in neighborhoods. So picture you know a suburb like down in country missouri a suburb of st louis i'm shooting you know in a good night anywhere from 16 to 20 deer in the front yard of a five million dollar house surrounded by other million dollar houses so there's no error to mess up um, it's all headshots um and you get so you work through the group of deer so you know a group of does come in you work down the age the age structure you find the excuse my french the cuntiest doe the alpha doe, and you start with her. You shoot her. So when you shoot a deer in the head, it drops to the ground. You have that couple seconds of total confusion for the other deer, like, what just happened? If you shoot them in the lungs, one deer runs, they all run. So you shoot them in the head, they drop. Every other deer is like, what just happened to mom? They bounce back. You start tapping through the group. Get down from the tree, put a ped bag on them so you don't have brains and blood all over the lawn. Um, hide them behind your tree, jump back up in the tree, and you continue on. Uh, we also did a lot of um, sterilization, so overectomies on those. Uh, we did a big project in Staten Island. We actually neutered all the bucks, so that's all dark guns. Um, you know, we did uh, island eradications, um, mule deer and elk out of helicopters, and we did a lot of cool stuff. I was in Guam for three months uh, working on Philippine deer and pigs. So it was, you know, there's when every, well, most of the projects we did, you know, we did a lot of necropsies and studying different uh, parasites. And, you know, we always had a vet with us. Um, but I mean, it was, it was a blast. It was really cool. But like I said, it was, I lived in a hotel with guys for eight months out of the year. You know, it was a great life for a single dude, but I couldn't imagine raising kids like that. So I want to talk about like the, sterilization side of it and especially from like a wildlife biology standpoint of it but like in that experience of going out at night 
in these suburban areas, all of these things, like, was there anything that you picked up or what did you learn during that time? Like about deer, about deer movement, about things that can help guys as, you know, just regular deer hunters. Just, you learn, I learned so much about just deer in general. Um, especially the way deer interact with humans. I mean, when you're out there setting up your tree stand and your bait sites, the deer, they're, they could be 10 yards from you. Like you feel like you could pet them. You know, people are hand feeding these deer. You're in such a suburban environment. There's no hunting. There's no firearms discharge. There's no bow hunting. There's nothing. That's why we're in there for deer vehicle collisions, Lyme disease. We're lowering the deer population because there is no hunting. And even if there was hunting in that environment, hunters could not lower the population like we could. In two weeks, we could kill four to 500 deer. All that meat's donated to soup kitchens, hunters for the hungry. Um, but just learning about deer. So the difference between deer know the difference between a uh, normal human and a hunter. They know when they're being hunted. So even though I'm in that suburban environment as a normal human, the second I'm in that tree, they know. Like they are, they're winding me. They're winding me, even though they just walked by 30 people that are walking through the park. They were bedded in that park all day long. And God knows how many hundreds of people walked by them. And they knew they weren't a danger. Or they were in that spot where they had an escape. The second you start hunting them and shooting them, it's a whole different ball game. So, you know, a lot of guys, oh, I said, you know, I'm hunting in a suburban area. The wind doesn't matter. Well, it does. You know, when you're right there on top of them in their area, it's something they know when they're being hunted. You know, it's as simple as that. So what you learn, just the deer behavior, understanding how a deer behaves, how it lives. I mean, their whole life goal is to survive. You know, they're being hunted constantly whether it's by coyotes or cars or hunters, you know? So just learn deer behavior, deer movement, wind, thermals, um, the amount of trail camera data that we went through. I mean, you're talking millions of pictures a year. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, we weren't just wild rednecks running into a suburban area and just blasting the heads off a of deer. You know, it's very meticulous, very structured, very planned, very safe, no room for error. I mean, you can't just start pumping bullets into a deer and have them running around the neighborhood. So it was, you know, and our biggest threat was the animal rights activists and hunters. So when we were shooting in an area where there were hunters, they were our worst enemy because they didn't like us because we were lowering the deer population for them and they thought they could do it themselves, which statistically proven they cannot. Um, and the anti-hunters, you know, we had tires slashed, we had windows broken, we had death threats, they wanted to behead us and our family, just like we did to the deer. When you shoot a deer in the head, their heart, it's uh, called radicachia, something like that. Their heart is still pumping for a good couple seconds to a couple minutes. And their, their muscles are going through like a reflex. So they're motionless for a couple seconds. And the second you get down and you throw that head bag on them, you're dragging them out of the area so other deer don't see them. Sometimes they're kicking and flipping around. They have no brain. The brain's gone. We call it canoe top. The bullet goes in. It's such a frangible bullet that it explodes. And the reason for that is you don't want a bullet to travel through the brain and continue going. So it goes in, 40 grain bullet, 40, 50 grain. So frangible, it explodes. Brain's gone. The whole top of the skull is gone. But there's videos of us dragging a deer, and people say, "Oh, they're suffocating a the deer. The deer's still alive." You know. So it was. It was. You know, intimidating as some as sometimes. A lot of times we had to have police ex escorts, um, or you'd have you'd be shooting in an area where you know this little old lady was feeding these deer for her entire life, and then here we come in to blow the deer's heads off, and she comes running at me screaming, "Please don't do it!" Crying. I'm like, "Ma'am, I totally understand. I get it, but this is my job. You know, I'm sorry." So then that's when you call the cop, and he comes and drags her away from beating you to death with her high heels but <laughs> it was it was a cool gig so from all that trail cam data and all that time in the tree in this nocturnal setting you know for guys that want to hunt bigger bucks or anything like that was there any takeaways that you could take from there that that maybe surprised you or things that you didn't you know that, that you had an aha moment kind of a lot of it was like <clears throat> just seeing how like groups of deer behave 
when you have your family groups of does and then your subordinate bucks and just like the bit the age structure of deer they're a whole community you know you could have you know a couple alpha does that are there with their fawns or offspring that they've been living in the same area for you know we shot deer that were 18 20 years plus because we had radio collared them years ago so the amount of stuff we learned from radio collaring deer was incredible and i, I was fortunate enough to get on and help out with a couple studies from uh, grad students and doctor programs where we were tracking mature bucks with radio collars in some fenced in areas and some wild areas um, but how you learn how they move first of all how lazy a mature deer is um, their movement during the day everyone thinks a nocturnal buck is just laying in his bed all day long not moving the second it's dark he's up and at it that's not true he's up all day long up down up down he may only go you know 20 feet during the day but he finds that one safe little hole and he's content there he'll get up and feed they have to feed constantly all day long you know they're not laying down for 12 hours um so you, and you learn how to if you want to hunt that mature buck you can't just forget about all the other deer you have to hunt the entire group of deer the second you step foot into those woods if the deer know so you know you can't just blast by does and be like ah oh, screw them that doesn't matter i'm after this buck that buck is sitting back and he knows what's going on by all those other deer. He knows when those subordinate bucks come in and something ain't right and they leave, even if they don't blow or they don't run. They pick up on all that stuff. And the amount of mature bucks that I've watched just sitting in the back, just chilling, watching everything go on, um, is pretty cool. So just basically the whole point of the story is learning how the whole it's you're basically hunting when you hunt when you have one target buck, you're hunting a whole community of deer. So it's obviously access is the biggest, biggest thing in the world. Access, knowing the wind, thermals, and, you know, how to get into an area without deer knowing, which is pretty much impossible, but getting into that area with the most minimal amount of intrusion. And then uh, from a wildlife biologist standpoint, like the sterilization of deer so i feel like there's got to be like some sort of dichotomy there with you because like you're a hunter and you're kill these deer and you donate the meat and now you're essentially just harming these deer i, I don't know I, I don't know how invasive or not invasive that procedure is but you're taking them out of their environment taking them over here giving them whatever surgery chemicals whatever and then sending them back out you'd think that that would be traumatic to a deer uh, to an animal that you care about but yeah, these, maybe not <laughs> the only like sad part i would say was you know deer their whole entire life revolves around breeding and reproducing so when you take that away from them, they're still getting bred but they're not reproducing obviously so like an overectomy on a doe you tranquilize it bring it back to a mobile vet station you know you're transporting on a stretcher very carefully like we're treating them like zoo animals you know, very professional. Um, tiny little incision, um, right in their belly, find the ovaries, take them out, cauterize them, sew them back up, give them a shot of antibiotics, and they're back to life in no time. Um, but it was basically, it can't, it all, the surgical sterilization came down to funding. You know, the animal rights activists, they would donate millions and millions of dollars to have you sterilize deer where they would fight you if you wanted to kill them. So they're, it's all up to the community. So say a town has a problem with deer, they're trying to get the funding, it's a big budget, animal rights activists will jump in and be like, well, let's sterilize the deer, here's a couple million bucks. So that's your only option. But we had projects where we'd sterilize and shoot. Um, we had projects where we were sterilizing um, for like a patrol for a study, uh, like what, like Staten Island, that came down to, it'd be almost impossible to sterilize all the does or to kill all the deer. And people didn't want all the deer dead so that's why we went to sterilizing the bucks and everyone thought that was impossible that you can't do it but you know it, we did it and it worked so it's it was definitely different it was fun i'd much rather shoot them that's what i was really good at but well it just seems like from you know so a lot of that makes a, a lot more sense and sheds a lot of light on some of the things that are happening here, like in Michigan. Like, so there was a big budget to go ahead and sterilize these deer in Ann Arbor. Well, if you think of the community, the extremely liberal community, 
around the University of Michigan and everything. It makes a lot more sense if there's donors saying, hey, we're, we'll give you the money to sterilize them. We know we have a problem rather than because everybody, all the hunters are like, just sell different licenses and, you know, let the hunters go in and do it. And I mean, f from the way that you've uh, spoken and kind of laid things out, especially for the margin of error type scenarios and, you know, talking with Taylor Chamberlain and like what those guys do in people's backyards regularly. Um, it, it totally makes sense that you're, you know, the average hunter isn't going to go and, you know, pay to clean somebody's pool when the deer dies in there or when the blood trail goes over the kid's play set and all that stuff, you know? Yeah, and the, uh, the recovery rate for the average hunter you know, is not that great. So that plays a huge part in it. But I guess the biggest thing that never really made sense to me was, okay, you sterilize the deer population over, you know, a 10 year, 15 year time period dramatically goes down. I get it. But that deer can still get hit by a car. It can still carry Lyme disease. It's still eating your bushes. You know, it's still going to live for a suburban deer could live 12 to 18 years. No problem. So that was the only thing that was, didn't really make sense, but I was getting paid. So, <laughs> so when you're, let's, we can move over to like some of the wild edge type stuff. Um, but like, so when you were in the trees in these setups, like at that time, like what were you using? Cause I'd imagine that those had to be somewhat mobile. They, I mean, you weren't just setting a ladder stand for a month in somebody's backyard or front yard. The old, the old uh, forget who made them the old tree lounges okay a climber so we just used um the actual tree stand part we didn't use a platform we didn't climb we just used bolts in the trees and then those little aluminum steps that you clip onto the flag bolt um i don't think they make them anymore but that was foolproof for us because we only needed one set of like 12 little steps and then we had a million lag bolts and you know in a, one project we could have 40 to 50 trees baits like prepped and ready to go and depending on the wind and activity that day and trail camera data, that's where we're going. We're bouncing around. So you have one tree stand. And the reason we used the tree stand was because we, you know, we would have it you know, at an angle like that, you know, pretty much parallel to the ground. So you're, we had foot pegs on, so your knees are up like this. So when you're shooting, you always have your three points of contact. So you're always stable. No matter where you go, switch hands, you're around the tree, you're locked in and solid. Um, and we, you know, some areas like New Jersey, I swear to God, the New Jersey deer, they come in hundred yards away. They're staring up into every tree, you know, it takes them an hour to come in. They're staring up every single tree. So it was a lot of areas where hunters were actively hunting. You'd be sitting next to a ladder stand, ladder stands 10, 12 feet off the ground. We're 30, 35 feet up in the air, nosebleed height. And those deer are staring at that ladder stand, just staring at it, you know, whole way in it was crazy um but yeah that was the setup you know super super comfy you would sleep in the thing but the biggest thing was having that stability to have an anchor point point. and so you said when you were younger and you know you and your buddies and you were uh familiar with the step family or or whatever um so how did you when you were first introduced to the wild edge steps and, and that's kind of like where everything kind of started there. What was your first impressions? Uh, I was 14 years old. My dad and I were teaching a bow hunter safety course. I was a junior instructor. So I was doing a section on uh, calling deer and field dressing. And then my dad did a section on uh, private land. In Connecticut, you need a private land permission slip. You need a permission slip signed by the landowner if you're going to hunt private land. And you have to have it on you at all times. And I remember Jim Step, the inventor of the steps, step ladder. He was uh, in the class because he always came to Connecticut from Maine with his buddy to hunt. But Connecticut made a new rule where if you didn't have a hunter safety certificate, you had to get one, blah, blah, blah. So I was doing the course. My dad pulled out a whole wad of private land permission slips. <clears throat> and Jim pulled us aside at the end of the course and said, hey, I got some uh, steps, a hunting product that I'd love to trade you guys for uh, access on some private land that you have. So like, sweet. So he took us to his van and showed us the steps, gave us a little demo. And honest Scott, I have the same couple sets that he gave me when I was 14 years old. And you know, I've honestly God been using them since. 
So with every combination of every climbing system, climbers, ladders, you name it. But um, yeah, that's that's how it all started. You know, I hunted. I've been hunting with Jim every year since I was fourteen. But uh, like I say, the the first impression, like, because you obviously didn't just say these are the end all be all because you hunted with every other thing known to man after that. So like, you're like, cool, we got some more hunting stuff or something else I don't have to buy or like, uh, these might work, these might not. Yeah, I mean, the second I used them, I was like, you know, cool. Those are sweet, <laughs> you know, I wasn't like, holy shit, like a first truck <laughs> thing, you know, but I used them. I left them in trees for years. And then it really didn't dawn on me how awesome they were until I started mobile hunting. So around that you know, 16 to 18 year range, you know, in high school, that's when, you know, I was mobile hunting. You know, I'd take my set of eight steps and that's when it, when it dawned on me. So I can remember as a kid, your hands are freezing, trying to screw in a screwing peg into a tree. You're like, oh my God, your hands feel like they're going to break and bleed. Um, and then climbing up them and climbing them down, it just hurt. And um, so that's when I went mobile, that's when it really dawned on me how awesome they were, packability, um, and how sturdy they were, especially, I mean, before saddle hunting platforms existed, it was a ring of steps, three to four steps around the tree. You know, and that's still my go to. Yeah. So um, we've got some. I, I, I bought some when we started all of this and like, uh, as I alluded to before, like I would have to sell everything and just be like, I'm just going to use those because of the, the thing. So I tried the knot, I did it a couple of times. And then like, then I had a hard time camming them over. And you, I, I, it's funny. Cause I think you just did a video like on Instagram, TikTok, and all that. Like if you're having a hard time camming them over, like, this is what you need to do. This is why the knot's wrong. But then I was putting them on like, really soft like pine trees and they're digging in uh, like i was like oh it's too it's too much it's too it's too much for me and so i give them to john john's like the super i mean he's from the listeners of the podcast he's like a nerd like an engineer type guy and he's like oh yeah you just do this and this and this and like like these are great and he used them i mean in, in light like exclusively for uh a year or so and, you know, we just doing this, you get, you know, we got to try this. We got to try this. We got to try this. But I mean, he still talks about them. Like he's like there, he, I think he used five and then used three for a ring of steps. Like, just like what you're saying, but his biggest thing. And I was just talking to somebody this morning. Who's like probably still my favorite climbing system ever. But his thing is like with the bag and everything, like you climb up the tree, you get done. You put one in the bag, put the rope out, down, down, down. And then when you're at the bottom of the tree, you're done. And like for a lot of people who want to do all this one sticking and all this other stuff, I mean, there's a lot of merit to that. Like when you get down and you don't have to pack anything up, you don't have to try and get these sticks to clamp together. And, you know, how, you know, where, what I do with the bungee or the night eyes gear tie or like all this other crap, you know, all of those things like, and a lot of times, like when you're done hunting, like you just want to be done. Like you just want to get out of the woods, you know? Yeah, what I do is, um, and I tell everybody this, on my way down, I don't even try to put them back in the bag. I just lower the steps, you know, lower them by the rope around the tree, not on top of each other. You know, if I'm in an area where I say, oh, screw this, I'm never coming back, then I don't care, I'll just drop them. But I, you know, scatter them around, then I get down and I pack them nice and neat, coil them up so they're ready to go for the next hunt. Um, but yeah, some guys do put them back in the bag. I just found it so much quicker, easier. You know, you're down that tree in seconds. But, you know, just the versatility of, um, you know, when you get to a tree, it's not like, you know, you get to a branch or young tree. It's not like, oh, which side of the tree am I going up? I just get to a tree, which is the easiest way to climb up. And as I'm going, I can just uncam that step, swing it around, and boom, I'm on the other side of the tree. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting I mean, I'm just trying to think of like what way I want to go with this. I got a whole bunch of things. The from the from the step side of it, right? So I I deal with lots of other companies and talk to all the saddle manufacturers. And you know, you're coming at this from a much different perspective. Is like, so if I was a a saddle hunting guy 
and I want to start a company and I'm like, okay, I got to have a saddle, right? The, I've tried every single saddle known to man and I don't like this saddle. I don't like this saddle. You know, I think I can make a better widget. Like I think I can make the best saddle. The problem that you have there is, and we're seeing it now in the industry is if you don't have a climbing system and a platform and ropes and all this other stuff. Now you have to essentially rely on your competitor to even just show off your product. Right. And so for you, the other side of it is, is like you started with a climbing system and then it was like, what do you do when you get up there? But I, but I think it's a lot easier to come at it from that way to essentially not have to reinvent the wheel on making a stick that doesn't look like somebody else's stick or making a platform that doesn't look like anybody else's platform or making a saddle, you know, you can tweak a saddle. So like, how has that process been like for you? Like what, what made you decide, okay, I'm going to start this company or I'm going to take over this company. And then how did that go into, to where you're at now? Um, I guess it's just uh, the way I grew up. Um, you know, if you didn't, you didn't have it you work to go get it if you couldn't get it you make it. you know kind of like the farmer mentality what do i have that i can make work without going and spending money kind of thing um so i've always been handy with my hands and making stuff so you know when we started with the steps um it went from the steps to okay where's everybody getting lines and ropes and lines and lines safety lines and tethers and so boom contacted the same rope company that made the rope for the steps hey can you make a legit climbing rope that we can use as a lines and line. Yep, boom. So I brought out a whole line of lines and you know went through the stages of going from the cheaper lines to the more high quality O plus. Um, so you know, rope started and carabiners and then got into developing the saddles and the platform. So it was basically my sister, who's one of my little sister, one of my biggest supporters, and she worked for us for Wild Edge and she always said, Drew, just step back and show your customers what you do. You know, because I, I always had it in my mind, well, people know that, you know, they know, they know where to put their tether. They know how to climb a tree, but it's like, no, you really have to educate people because there's a lot of people that don't know. They look at you like, what in the world is, is this kid doing? So then I started, going, you know, I always, I still to this day, I have to step back. Like the other day, I posted that video on the, on the steps. And the amount of feedback I got was unreal because I hadn't posted a, that simple, simple thing in such a long time. So it was really just creating what I had done for so long and making legit products out of it. Um, you know, what works for me, my biggest mentality, my biggest motto is, you know, from the military, the KISS system, keep it simple, stupid. You know, I'm not about all the gadgets and gizmos. And, you know, if a saddle is designed correctly, you don't need a pack band. Um, it, and I don't like stuff hanging off me. I don't like dump pouches. And you see some guys load their saddle up. And but back to uh, you do whatever works for you, right? So I just stuck with the mentality of keep it simple. Everything should be simple. So you're going to hunt. Hunting should be the complicated part of hunting. Hunting and killing deer, whether it's a button buck or a mature buck, that is the goal. It shouldn't be hard to climb a tree. We've been climbing trees since the dawn of man, right? So how do you make it so? When you go into the woods, it's brainless, effortless to climb a tree. Because the second you get frustrated, then you get lazy. The second you get lazy, you're less productive. You lessen your chances at actually killing or seeing deer. So if climbing a tree is easy, simple, smooth, then you take that out of the equation for how to kill a deer. So the progression of the company from going from the steps to now creating a platform and then having a, a saddle line has been, I don't know, tumultuous <laughs> for you. Um, maybe not the, the, the easiest uh, of, of roads and maybe as hadn't been like how you had seen it in your head. Like, did you, would it have been easier for you just to say like we have these steps like maybe we'll make a platform or make a make a tree stand instead so you're i don't know i don't see all the uh well, the biggest click for me was um 
when at early stages, I remember having, when I first started the company, I was having like a freaking mental breakdown. I was working side jobs. I was still contracting, killing deer. I was working side jobs, doing excavation, masonry work. <clears throat> I was all over the place and struggling to pay the bills. You know, I just rented the first shop that we had. I put an addition on it for the welding shop, make product in the house. Um, you know, I remember looking at my dad, like almost in tears, like how in the F am I going to afford this? How is this making sense? All this money is coming in, but it's going out twice as fast. Like, how does this work? And that's when my first investor, my dad's best friend came into the equation, knew nothing about hunting, self-made millionaire, first job was at Arby's. He started coaching me and investing in the business. And he's, he would go on these coaching. Um, a lot of successful guys are into, they're always into learning more. So the whole coaching aspect, being coached by successful millionaires and then coaching other people. So he would have these programs, like he'd go to the coaching class that would, I don't know how much it costs, hundred grand. You know, he's going to learn more about how to build his business better. And he would send my sister and I those programs that he already paid for. So we got to do them for free. And one of them was from David Bayer and it was called Mind Hack. So how to basically, there's a lot of meditation stuff, you know, sit down, like you talk softly, close your eyes, you do worksheets, close your eyes, break down. What do you see in the next year? What do you see in the next two years? What do you see 10 years from now? And honestly, God, on my kids' lives, I was sitting there and I envisioned my new shop next to my new house on a piece of land. You know, I, I envisioned taking the kids to the freaking bus stop while mom had already left for work. Um, I just pictured that lifestyle and that's the lifestyle that I have today. Um, and a lot of it, the biggest whole point of that was, it was find your niche. Like, yes, you can have a product and you can sell it to a million different people that use it for a million different things. But you need to take that, say if it's only 7% of a million people, um, then you target that 7% as your niche. So I'm thinking in my head, what's my niche? Well, my niche is saddle hunting. And that was way before saddle hunting was cool. Um, so I was like, all right, that's my niche. My goal is to be the first one-stop shop for saddle hunting. I almost got there. Um, we're there today. But, you know, that was kind of the light bulb when I focused on my niche is saddle hunting. But then it's funny because it almost got to such a drastic degree that I was so focused on saddle hunting that we often get questions from people. Hey, can you use the steps for tree stands? I'm like, you know, light bulb. All right. Settle down a little bit. Now post pictures of using a tree stand, even though I don't use tree stands. So it's it was pretty cool because I can remember selling steps to guys um, doing, you know, to wildlife biologists who are studying mushrooms. Um, up in trees and need a mobile system to find a tree to study pick mushrooms wildlife biologists studying birds um, in Malaysia I sold a couple hundred sets of steps to these biologists um, people that have coconut trees in their yard you can't put a ladder up to a coconut tree it's pretty dangerous so they climb the coconut tree with the steps to pick the coconuts so they don't fall on their kids head to kill them. Um, tree houses place scapes you know just crazy stuff but I was, you know, everyone was giving me ideas and I was so sporadic all over the place. Like, how do you target the market for climbing a coconut tree? But that's when I, you know, stepped it back. All right, niche saddle hunting, put everything into that. And that's when it's like, all right, I've already used a saddle. Why can't I make my own? You know, and then how do you find a company that can make the saddle? I failed three different t times through different companies trying to make the saddle that I wanted until I found the right company. Um, and then, you know, ropes, how do you find the right company that are, legit climbing ropes um who can, if i can't make something who can make it and i learn to make it and i invest in like this shop i built it to invest in down the road robotic welding for the steps a lot more cost effective cnc robotic welding you have a robot pumping out steps all day long instead of paying a welder to stand there for 100 bucks an hour so it's i mean it's been a it's been a game it's been a long journey but i mean i'm the kind of guy where i get an idea and i just do it i'm not methodical about it the only thing i'm methodical about really is hunting um when it comes to business i just i get an idea i get something in my head and i just you know, hands back head first dive into it let's go so from from that side of it like the the industry like how long have you been involved in this and then where do you see like a 
like for you, like how do or how did like the trade shows and stuff fit in to that sort of uh, component of it? And then the other side is like the, the industry, especially around the saddles seems extremely uh, in some ways like competitive and polarizing like where there's you know sometimes the animosity between different guys different companies and sometimes it's outward and then other times it's like you know it's all bottled up and and inward but it's you know there's still that that feel yeah it's i mean i learned i swear i I tell a lot of people i i the only way i learn is the hard way um, sometimes that's the best way to learn, you know, by screwing up. Um, I've signed contracts without running by my attorney. Got screwed. I've shooken hands thinking that a man's handshake is worthy, and it wasn't. Um, I've been screwed a lot. I, you know, it's, I, but at the same time, I don't look at the past. I just learn from it. Um, I can remember the first trade show we ever went to 2017 was the Harrisburg Great American Outdoor Show. I was so nervous. I'd never done a trade show. I've been to hunting expos, but never done one myself. I was freaking out. Um, but, you know, it was cool to see the progression of saddle hunting, you know, from 2017 to present day. 2017, 18, it was like guys look at you in a saddle on the demo pole to show me like, what in the freak is this guy doing like I, what what are you doing kid and then the next year okay kind of get it to present day they're at your booth let me try it on i've tried this i've tried that boom 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 let's ah uh, they're all into it you know pretty much everybody knows what's going on so it's cool to see that progression um and then you know just learning it's everything's always changing um but to me, competi- competition breeds innovation. I mean, there's no need to be suing people left and right because your stick looks like his stick and that platform looks like that platform. And, you know, it's like, why can't we just, if he is, that company's platform looks badass and it looks sweet, perfect, I love it. Well, why can't you just come out with something better? Or why can't you just improve on what you, improve on what you have and bring something better to the market? You know, that the, the biggest F you to your competition is to come out with something better, not to bad mouth them, not to, you know, go through legal battles and waste money. I'm all about investing money and spending money on assets, but I'm not, I hate wasting money. So it's, you know, I could have bought my, I could have put my kids through college the amount of attorney fees that we've had throughout the years. It's sick enough. You talk to the attorney on the phone for an hour, it's 650 bucks. So from, from that aspect of it, or like the, uh, I guess, where do you feel like the climate of the, the hunting industry is? Because I, I say that, and I was thinking about this way back in the podcast where you were talking about running around and acting like a squirrel, right? Like the industry isn't going to sell you that because they don't make any money off it. They're not, I mean, it doesn't really seem where we're at right now is everything is like product based. Like this is going to help you. These are the best thing. Like, Oh, look at this. And I'm a, I'm a a victim. I'm guilty of it also because it's like new and shiny and like, Oh, that'd be cool to try. That'd be cool to try, but you're just given, you know, just dollars, dollars, dollars and not, is it really going to help you? You know, I tell so many guys, you know, I try to preach back to keep it simple, stupid. It, like you said, buying the best newest bow isn't going to kill your deer. Buying the best $500 backpack won't kill your deer. Um, you know, all the little gimmicky stuff. It's there's yeah, your equipment has a lot to do with your success. Right. But it's, you know, when do guys go overboard into you know, making it so complicated that you're taken away from it and all the gimmicky stuff where it's like the biggest thing about hunting is learning how to hunt, right? Understanding not just hunting deer, but understanding how the whole entire ecosystem around deer affects deer and your hunting. There's a lot of other factors that can mess up a hunt besides deer, wind, thermals, buck bedding. 
everyone's so focused on buck betting thermals win, buck betting thermals win. It's like, then guys go, well, if I'm going to hunt, I need to, A, I need to be 25 feet in a tree. I need the latest, greatest bow, saddle, backpack. I need to climb with one stick like him and do that. And they're forgetting everything else that goes into hunting. So it's, and you watch, you know, all the hunting shows. I used to love Drury Outdoors when they were hunting on a tree stand, rattling in deer, grunting in deer, calling at deer. It was freaking awesome. And then all of a sudden, now they're hunting out of muddy box blinds. And the hardest part about the hunt is opening the window. Like it's an extravagant thing to open the window to get a shot of the deer in a beautiful biologic field. It's like really not fun to watch. You know, so it's almost where that industry, industry, you have to kill big giant deer every year to be cool. You have to have the latest, greatest gear. Your camo has to match your backpack. Your camo has to match your boots. Your bow has to have cool, colorful strings on it. And it's like, there's not many people out there. Like, look at Fred Bear. What did he wear? He had a freaking stick and a string, a couple arrows and a flannel jacket. You know, the amount of deer I killed in Carhartts uh, with either a big lip in or a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. You know, I killed a lot of deer like that. Our hearts, stinky, soaking diesel from stripping foundation forms covered in concrete. I mean, it's it's just crazy to see how people are so focused on what they need, the materialistic things. They forget about the basics. In fact, I remember my dad and I, when my first camo was going to the Quonset hut, go to the Army surplus store and getting old fatigues. You know, or stealing my dad's L.L. Bean polar fleece tree bark camo. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. It was so cool and cozy and warm. Um, it was just, life was so simple back then. It was, and it was so fun. Like my buddies and I, the amount of deer drives we did, just having fun, like killing every spike in the woods, four points. I mean, you name it, anything to walk by, we killed it. We would go in the woods animal hunting for the 22. We're shooting songbirds, squirrels, chipmunks, crows, you name it. We're just killing stuff. And it was so fun. And then, you know, I found myself getting so focused on the reason I got so focused on killing mature bucks is killing deer for a living almost, I want to say ruined me, but it changed me. When you spend eight months out of the year blowing the head off of mainly does and fawns, your appetite to kill a doe is gone. I, my rule is if she's, if she's being a, you know what, then she dies, but I rarely kill a doe, you know, except for meat, but the, to kill a mature buck, it was just, it was more of a challenge and less likely to happen. Um, so that, you know, that changed me a bit, but we still go back to doing the drives. You know, when I'm with my family, my uncles, cousins, and sister, dad, you know, friends, we go, we do drives all year long with the bows, with guns, shotguns, muzzle loaders, you name it. And it's just a blast. You know, you don't care who kills what it's, it's just a good old time, but you know, it, and then back to people on social media, if they kill a four point, it's only cool if it's on public land, you know, and I don't need to preach it. Everybody says it a thousand times, whatever makes you happy. You know, I've killed basket eight points that were maybe scored 30 inches that made me more excited than my 150 inch deer that I shot. No. so uh, for us you know i love bow hunting because of the the challenge of it and all of the i, I don't know i think maybe i'm addicted to messing up like i don't I like because that's like what i feel like helps you grow and like it makes when you are successful that much you know sweeter you know because of all of the things that it took you to 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 get there um but you know you're right we're, we live in a day and age where you know social media says th- th- it almost dictates like the kind of hunter or the kind of person or like kind of like what you're you should strive to be right and so i guess what would you say because we've got a lot of listeners that you know they they listen to us and they're like well i'm only gonna bow hunt or i'm not gonna you know, I know this is a bow hunting show. I know you're a bow hunter, all these types of things. But I think like what you kind of said there is like, I think a lot of people are missing out on a lot of stuff by having this mindset of, well, I only can do this or I only can do that. Like, yeah. why can you only do that? Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even as 
you know, I, I love gun hunting. You know, I love bow hunting to death. I would take that over anything in the world. But if I can put a high powered rifle in my hands and I can reach out to 200 yards, you're goddamn right I'm taking a rifle. You know, a buck with a rifle means just as much to me as a buck with a buck. You know, a dead mature deer is a dead mature deer. I don't care how you kill it. Um, so, yeah, they def people definitely lost. You know, it's people don't, uh, I guess, appreciate a deer killed with a gun versus bow. Or I'm a bow hunter only. Well, no, you're a hunter. You know, it doesn't matter what weapon you use. You're still a hunter. So, you know, and, you know, whatever, do whatever. Just like uh, what's your climbing system? What's how you use what platform? How do you configure your platform? Where do you put your tether height? You use two lines up, you use a dump pouch, well, you do whatever works for you, right? Yeah, I think, like, from my perspective on that, and, like, that's why it'd be, it's, it's easy. Um, it would be easy for me to, to go to uh, a saddle company and say, hey, I want to be sponsored by you or whatever, because we talk a lot about saddle hunting. A lot of our stuff is centered around saddle hunting, but I don't want to not be able to have this conversation right because you know trophy line or tethered or latitude or you know whoever they say well well that's not good for for us you know um because i've tried just about every saddle known to man and i can i feel like i can count like what you said like what works for you what works for you what works for you like i think and you can probably do this too but I can probably, when, when someone says like, I'm thinking about this saddle on social media and you, you can just read and like, look at their names, look at their profile picture and see like what they're going to say before they even say it. And so for me, I just shoot them a message and I'm like, Hey, what's your hunting style? What's your body type? Like, what's your goal out of all of this? And I can probably point them in the direction that they're going to be happier than if they just l looked in, at the pole and it said i have a phantom i have trophy line you know and all these guys are on staff <laughs> you know so it's like it doesn't you know have that's why i respect your podcast so much because you're so honest and you're not a fanboy of everything which is that's that's how you're going to learn opposed to a podcast that's sponsored by a company well, of course, you know, the biggest marketing budget always wins. So of course, people here sponsored by this, that's all they're going to talk about. But or you have people bashing your saddle and they love this saddle. But then it comes out in the comments. Well, have you actually tried that saddle? No. Mm -hmm. Well, then how do you know? You're a Chevy guy, you're a Ford guy. You ever driven a Ford? You ever driven a Chevy? You know, it's back to whatever works best for you. And also, there's a lot of people out there that are getting paid to use products which mm -hmm. is, you know, the infomercials and it, it's, you know, there's girls that have YouTube channels of whatever amount of followers getting paid good money just to wear a product. I've never paid anybody, anybody to use my products. And I will never do that. If I could have, I would love to be able to afford to pay Levi Morgan, but my, you know, just like made in America, I always want to stick with that. I don't, I don't want to pay someone to use my stuff and talk about how good it was because they're getting a check mm -hmm. so with your saddle like so you sent me a couple saddles and i told you like because there is so many people out there that are like just send me one just send me your gear just send me send me your stuff and i'm like i don't respect those people <laughs> you know i mean and people send me a lot of stuff like it's it, so it's not like this but like i'm not going to sit here and have a conversation with you about your saddle and never having seen it or held it or sat in it or done anything because it's like those guys are only like oh it sounds cool it looks great like i yeah. can't wait to try it i'll i'll get on that you know um but so from the saddle perspective like what went into this like where did you take your cues from because there's i mean i think in the the saddle world there's a few different companies that have a few different mentalities and then i think there's some other guys who are actually real about what they say and they say you know I, I really like this i really like this and this is how we made this product better or this is how we did this 
differently and not i just came up with this all on my own i've never even seen another saddle and this one it's just, it just came to me like i'm a jehovah's witness sorry if you're a jehovah's witness but like <laughs> but but like so like you said you don't like uh molly or you don't like dump pouches and things like that but this has like the harder wider loops and it's got it, it has a real tx5 kind of styling uh yep. to Ed me Hopkins was the one that helped me he built the first prototypes so matt <laughs> helped me invent that saddle um but that saddle started back in 2017 when i was messing around with my sister's uh she used to make lingerie for Victoria's Secret and design all kinds of clothing, wedding dresses. And so she, the seamstress, she could sew anything. So I had her develop some of my first prototype saddles and then trying to find a company to make them. I had uh, two companies that made the first couple of prototypes that were complete garbage. Um, and then, you know, that evolved into working with other companies. Um, and that actual saddle right there, it was done, finished, ready to go to market three years, two years before it actually was allowed to come to market due to legal stuff working with other companies, long story short. But that saddle was invented back when the only other companies in the market were tethered and arrowhead. So we're talking back 2018, 19. So that's, and it wasn't allowed to come out until all the legal BS was done. So I was behind the game. I would have been the first saddle hunting one-stop shop company in the entire market. So the one thing about this saddle that I'm I'm perplexed by, I guess, it was different. The the leg straps are different. Uh, there's I got another saddle over there that has a different set of leg straps you know there's there's like the normal buckles that that are like the mini cobra buckles or whatever and this has a different i'm not sure what you you what what's the the buckle that's on there Those the main the, buckle that saddle and everything on there especially those leg buckles they're made by kong usa so okay kong, they make those in their factory so those buckles you know i was looking at i wanted a lightweight buckle for the legs that was easy to use, less noticeable than a big giant raptor buckle. Um, so, but my biggest thing about the leg buckles was I didn't want three buck, three pieces of metal, three buckles sitting on my crotch. Because when you relax in the saddle, then they're all right there, flying against each other. I don't care if you tape them or what do you do with them. Um, so that's why I positioned them to the side. So the leg straps are to the side, up by your hips. Your waist buckle is over to one side. So there's nothing right in the middle. So you're not hitting your cam or bow on anything metal to metal out of the way. So when Kong showed me those buckles, we went through. I can't tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, how many buckles we went through to try to find the right one. And that one was just perfect in my mind. Okay. And then maybe, maybe it's a cover your ass type thing. Maybe it's a, um, I don't know insurance deal i don't know what the 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 reasoning is but everybody has theirs uh, is there a reason they're not removable um i yeah safety liability i mean yeah a g-hook can work and work great but um biggest thing i found with the g-hooks is walking into the woods they would fall off and then you have two leg straps getting caught on shit and flapping around and my biggest thing was when i put the saddle on i want it to be tight i want it to fit me everything be sleek and I don't want to know what's there when I'm walking in. So I want everything in there. Good. I don't want anything hanging off. That's why I don't like dump pouches. Um, I don't like stuff hanging, flapping. Um, so like when you're using eight millimeter rope, I mean, it's in my cargo pocket or it's in my, in my chest with my waist buckle around. Um, so just simple, what works like the, the whole style of saddle is always the one inch Molly loop on the back. Well, try to put a carabiner in that when you're sitting in it. You know, I always have two, three carabiners hanging off my saddle. I hook my bow to one on my back when I'm climbing. Um, you know, and as I get set up, my bow comes, my backpack comes off, goes to the tree. My bow comes from my saddle. So then my bow hanger goes on. So I have a whole system. But <clears throat> the biggest reason I have my bow on me is because how many times I've been climbing up or down a tree and you have deer come in and your bow is on the ground. 
where you're trying to pull your bow up and it's smashing against limbs and it's just an absolute nightmare. So I always have my bow on me. So to have a bigger loop where you can mindlessly in the dark without thinking about it, grab a carabiner, hook it, hook your bow, or before I set up, if I haven't had the chance to put my backpack on the tree yet, I hang my backpack off my saddle. So my saddle is basically a giant utility belt as I'm getting set up. Um, so that was the whole reason of the bigger gear loops. And then in the side, there are bigger, wider with the three inch webbing that is for a dump pouch. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty comfortable. It's got the, uh, it's got the um, elastic right in the center and then it's got the, the pleats so that you can open it up. Now with the pleats, you know, obviously the, the one that comes to mind for me is the cruiser xc but the arrow hunter one is like i think maybe the first one to do that is that the one that they were doing for you yeah the, well they the kestrel flex was the one that they had and then i liked the pleat how it opened um and that's when i developed the yarrick which failed um the saddle didn't fail it was a great saddle they just the arrow hunter couldn't keep up with the production that they had promised me to make the saddles um, so got out of that, but my biggest thing about the pleat was, yeah, an adjustable seat's great. It opens up, but if it opens up once and stays open, it's completely useless. You might as well just wear a bigger saddle. So my biggest thing was when I was working with Matt Tompkins, how do we develop a saddle that you can open and close and it stays open and closed? So I want to open the top or just the bottom, just the bottom, just the top, or I want to completely close it or open it and it actually stays in its form. So that's how we came up with that. Okay. And I like the fact that it's mesh. Like I've got one of the TX5s, I think this is Lone Star. And I, I, I like it. It's, it, the thing is beautiful. It's a, like a work of art. Like he does amazing stuff. My main concern with it is it's so thick. Like, yeah, in the wintertime, it would be great, but early season or for anybody that's like on the East coast or like Florida or whatever, man, it just seems like it would be, the hottest thing like known to man like so i love that that this one is mesh yeah, even with the the elastic in the center yeah that was a one of the biggest things was you know a lot of southern hunters saying that's why they love the yard because it was completely all mesh and so that's why i stuck with it and then i went back and forth with different colors and uh camel patterns and i was just i just stuck with black it's so neutral um but then you also get the customers well it's not camel deer are gonna see me well if a deer's staring at your ass you got bigger problems <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i think that a a lot you know you go back to the what you said about fred bear you know like i don't know if you're familiar with uh michigan guys down in georgia now jason sam koviak he's the traditional wilderness uh podcast it's like i don't know how long it is traditional wilderness and bow hunting podcast or whatever but he hunts and just like the walmart pants and like just a fl fleece jacket and he's hunting with a longbow you know shooting deer at six yards and he's like you don't need camel you just need the right setup you know that's what I, I tell a lot of guys that a lot of my buddies that will get frustrated halfway through the season i always tell them like well look what what are you doing you're so focused on Oh, this platform came out. I got to try it halfway through the season. This back, I got to try this backpack, this camel bone. I'm like, well, as you're changing stuff, like you got to think back to what worked, right? Or if you screwed up, why'd you screw up? That's a success if you screwed up because you learn and most likely you'll try not to do it again. Um, but to be so focused on all your gear, it's like, well, step back, forget the gear. Don't even bring a saddle or a climbing system. Grab your weapon and go hunt still hunt walk learn you know scout the area that's when you're gonna learn you know mm -hmm. you're not, I, I remember last season i i switched from my badlands pack to the sicka pack it's pretty much the same exact pack a little bit different i was like a monkey fucking a football it was my system was so dialed in halfway through the season i've been preaching this and i did it to myself i switched and i was all over the place it took me a couple hunts to really dial it in because I'm, I'm searching like with my memory as, as to where things should be and they weren't there. So I was slower. I was making mistakes. So it's, you know, just keep it simple. Go back to yeah. your roots. 
you know, go if you want to learn, you want to learn a lot about deer hunting, go squirrel hunting. Grab a 22 or get some blunt tips for your bow. Go try to kill some squirrels on the ground. You'll walk up on a lot of wildlife. <laughs> we have to uh, employ that since uh, our small game season starts a lot sooner than our uh, our bow season does. Um, and so, so I got your platform here too, right? And this is, you said you've got some, but they're not out yet. And this is another thing, like, I, one of the things that I really like about this whole conversation and about, you know, talking to you is like, I asked you, I'm like, Hey, this platform, you know, and I knew that you were working with Matt Garris to, you know, with out on a limb and he helped you out. I think with the perch and then with the platforms, you know, and I'm saying, Oh, this has a real, you know, out on a limb feel. And you're like, it's cause you make some. And the same thing with the TX five though, it just gives me like a, 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 a really good idea of like, you as a person as a businessman because like it's a lot more efficient to have somebody that you can work with that does what you want to do you know like knowing you're not the smartest person in the room right <laughs> like like hey i could try to reinvent the wheel and i can make my own saddle and we come up with this thing from scratch or you know there's this guy over here doing it he does great work maybe we can work with him yeah. And he can make a saddle for us or he can make a, a, a platform for us. So what did you have for platforms prior to this one? And then what, what went into the design of this? Like what, what needed to change to get this one, you know, to what it is right now? Well, that's, you know, it goes back to my entire life. My dad, most positive guy in the world. We grew up with little to no money. Um, but no matter if we were bankrupt, broke, what happened growing up my dad was always the happiest cheerful positive dude in the room um but his biggest thing that he pounded in my head was surround yourself by people who are better than you who are more successful smarter so if you surround yourself by smarter people you will be successful um so matt garris as exam as an example out on wind manufacturing is my competitor but he is like a brother father to me he we talk you know, almost every day, if not four or five times a week. Um, and he is the greatest guy in the world. We're best of friends. He's almost like a father figure to me. We work together. Trophy line. I love those guys. We work together. They own the trademark of Saddle Up, but they don't mind letting me use it kind of thing. I pick their brain on the, their business model. And what do you do with your pro staff and your ambassadors? Like, how do you structure that? And, you know, Nick Betts laid it out to me. This is how we do it. Gave me advice. It's like, that's the way it should be in my mind. You know, I'm totally respectful and open-minded to everybody, and um, I love learning and creating relationships, but the second you overpromise and underdeliver or you screw somebody, it's cut off, and that's what's led to a lot of hiccups in the business, but, you know, working with Matt, the whole story behind the platform is I have, I can't tell you how many dozens of prototypes of the perch that I was trying to design a platform that was either detachable or connected permanently to the step like here i have a step that works perfect as a platform but we want a little more space on it want a little more foot room um so i was struggling struggling and all of a sudden out of the blue from a friend of a friend my buddy garrett who's a modern assassin on instagram he was friends with matt i had met matt at a trade show my first year at harrisburg he bought a set of steps so i'd already known him but then he reached out to me on facebook hey i got something for you i think i can make it work like, okay I call Garrett. Who is this dude? I think I met him once. Boom. He's like, he's a great dude. Listen to him. He's smart. He knows he's, he can, he's a fabricator. So I get on FaceTime. This is right before the Iowa show. Um, and Matt's boom. We're literally developed the perch through FaceTime. He's in Oklahoma. I'm in Connecticut. You know, it's went through ideas. He's like, boom, I'll have this may I'll have this idea tomorrow morning, Saturday morning. Boom. Made it. Oh, we're going through how to change out of, you know, I'm, critiquing it boom 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 long story short that's how the perch was developed i paid him a royalty um for developing the perch every perch that was sold i gave him x percent for two years um created that great relationship and then boom guys wanted a bigger platform but matt's bracket for the ridge runner and the podium was so popular it's a foolproof awesome bracket he makes as a Matt. and then we kind of do a similar agreement and i can 
can you make me a bigger perch on your bracket? So I bought the brackets from him at my company in Texas, the Fab Shop Makes Platform, boom, merge them together. We have an out of the limb, half an out of limb product, half wild edge product together, boom. Matt, now I love how, what you did with the new Ridge Runner with the post. I think that could be freaking sweet. Can you make me one with the Battleman platform? Perch Battlements, different size. Absolutely, boom. That one, that's how that was born. So it's, you know, working together and it's so easy and it's fun. You know, bringing some of the guys that have similar ideas and, you know, we vent to each other all the time. We strategize, what's your marketing company doing? What's your company doing? What, what are you paying for insurance this year? You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, down to the nitty gritty, we're, we're a team, but we compete. Sure. So I think that's awesome because there's only so many people that are going to have the same, uh, I guess, problems as you are. Like you can't talk to your insurance guy or your auto body guy about the, the same types of issues that you're dealing with you know it's different industry different liabilities different different complete climate so it's great from that perspective i mean i do that with podcasts all the time like i've got tons of friends that i've made just through podcasting that i talk to regularly to try to you know see what are you doing how are you doing this like how can we be better you know it's like a you know i grew up in a small town everybody knows everyone graduating my graduating class was 90 something people. I mean, everybody knew everybody in town. But the beauty about that is even to this day, you know, when I was building a shop, you know, if I had a question about plumbing or electrical, I knew exactly who to call. If I had a question about where to get cheaper lumber here or what company you use to build that shop, boom, well, can you come help me? Hey, my machine's down. Can I borrow yours? I'll pay you, blah, blah, blah. It's just like a community. And in my mind, I always thought that's how business was until you really you realize the hard way how also important an attorney and contracts and <laughs> writing work. A uh, guy's handshake only goes so far sometimes. Um, so, but yeah, it's just like, it's always a community. Like, that's why I love this town. And I'd be in Idaho in a heartbeat if I could take up all my buddies and my family and move them with me. But I'd be, if I just went alone, I'd have to restart what I built for 30 years here. You know, mm. in my mind, that was always how the, an industry would be, but sadly it's not. They can be though. So, in I, I guess it's it's the royalties thing. I guess that's probably the way that it should work. You know, it needs to work for for everybody. But developing that relationship and like having this platform, like you know, completely. I mean, it would be so easy for him to just sell this, right? I mean, like. And just not have to ship it to you, not have to just be like, all right, I'm just going to do this. Right. right. So like what of this is from like your design? I mean, did Matt do all of this or like what, what are your favorite features about the, the battlement platform? And I mean, because I'm not a platform guy um, and I can tell you what I what I like about this and some of the concerns that I had just from my perspective. Yep. Um, but so I, I will give Matt 100% credit for what's in your hands right now. Um, starting with the perch, like we, he was say 80% the inventor on that. And I helped a little bit like critiquing small details that mattered. But so he's, he's on the patent for the perch as the inventor. I'm the co-inventor, whatever. Um, so he, that is stemmed from out on limb manufacturing all my platforms. Um, so he gets all the credit for that. What I love about it was at first I was ring a step guy, came out with a perch. I grew to like the perch just because it was so small, compact. Um, and then guys got into a lot of the reason I developed other products where it's for the customer. If it was up to me, I would never I probably would never have a bigger platform. Because the guys had in their mind, like they go from tree sand hunting to saddle hunting, they think they're still tree sand hunting. Like I need a giant platform for my feet. Well, a platform is just a way to get around the tree. So if you just have one single platform, it may be harder to get around the tree than if you have a step on each side or a peg or something, you can stick your heel, your toe in. So when I go to my weak side on my right side, I turn around the tree. If there's a step on the left side of the tree, I'm shoving my toe right in that baby. It's like a stirrup. I will never slip, slide, turn, I'm locked in. Um, so everybody 
we got in that a couple of years ago, that phase of Excel platform, Excel platform, it's got to be big, 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 big. And in my mind, I'm like, it makes no sense, but guys want a bigger platform, so I'll make it. So I came out of the Battlement, which was a bigger perch than that's bracket. And I grew to love it. I used it because it's my product and I should probably know how to use it. And you taking photos of me actually using it, fell in love with it. I'm like, this freaking thing is sweet. But then I'm like, well, it'd be sweeter if we could angle it more. So without changing the bracket and gusting it and making different angles for that leverage and going through that, that's when that newer platform came out with the angle, with the post. And then I'm looking at that top step going, that could be sweet, but I don't know if it is. Then I tried it when Matt brought it to me at Harrisburg. That's when we, I first put my hands on it. I had seen pictures, I was drooling over it. Not only does it look sexy as hell, once you stand on it, it is rock solid. Like you cannot move that thing. Like you could bash it with an excavator on the side and it's not gonna budge. It just locks to that tree with just the way the standoffs are and the way you cam it over. Like I was telling you, you can't just suck that baby to a tree and then try to cam it over it. It'll go so tight that it'll be doing a wheelie. You gotta get that strap not you know in that right spot and then cam it over. Um, but once I started using it with that top step, it was like, this is money. Like I can tow hook this, I can hook my heel. Like my biggest thing in this in the saddle is I don't want to ever feel like I'm going too far and then you're in the oh shit moment of I'm done, like I'm spinning. So to have that ability to lock it on and that would, you know, if I have the steps, I always have one on each side, but with that platform, I feel like I could be 100% successful without anything on the side. So yeah, and like I say, I'm, I'm not a, a platform guy, um, not a ring of steps guy. Like I like having the top stick and have that small little tiny platform and that artisan outdoor fabrications one was one of my favorites. I ran the wingman all year last year. And I think the wingman, uh, maybe, you know, right off the top of your head on this one, what the depth of it is, but it's less than say like a predator or the EDP or the seeker. So that is less of as less depth than the battle. The battlement you're getting more depth to the tree because of the bracket. But with that, with this one, it's just basically the biggest thing is the grip on the platform. Your feet are like glue on that thing. And just like to have that top step, it's just instead of having like um, like trophy lines rubber knob on the top, you know, that's a great idea that that works, but I just find it you can slip. So my mm -hmm. thing about platform is I if I'm gonna use a platform. I'm going to be locked into that tree. I do not have room for error to slip because we all know when a deer is coming in, you're at that tree. Like the hardest part about saddle hunting is which side of the tree am I going to shoot from? Is he coming this way? That way you're like a squirrel around the tree. You're like, but, and it could be detrimental if you went to this side and then he's on that side, you know? So your feet, like you, your, your feet and your body, your feet and your hips are the, what's controlling your entire body when you're saddle hunting, rotating your hips and your feet. So that's when you're just standing on, say, a square box on a platform, you have a lot less mobility and structure, I guess, stability to go around the tree. Yeah, but I, the reason I was asking about the depth is, like, not because of what I'm, the when I'm standing up there. Like, I, I, I like the maneuverability. Like, I, I'm a leaner. Like, I'm not, I'm not standing at all the only, like the only times that that top stick platform was an issue to me was like when i was hanging up my when i was setting my tether and when i was hanging up my backpack and setting my bow hook because i had to pull my lineman all the way up to the tree so that i couldn't lean back um because there wasn't enough room and the reason is for me is it's one more thing to set up and with those larger platforms or the ones that are deeper. And that, like I said, this one isn't, isn't as deep as a, a, what I would call like a standard platform. Um, is it dealing with it inside of my lineman's belt? So, you know, you're, you're either got to be far enough back and you're trying to set it up when you cam it over and everything and holding onto the tree. And this is, you know, I'm going to get called like, Oh, you know, just do it. It was like, blah, blah, blah. I could do it in the dark with my eyes closed and stuff like that. Well, I know Great. Know. You know how to solve that? <laughs> a lot that? of guys don't understand. Like you're saying, 
So when you're connected to the tree, you're about to pull your platform on your lines and belts right here, right? Mm -hmm. Loosen it up and let it drape down. So your, your rope is going down. It's totally out of the way. People always have it in their mind that your lines and line has to be right here. Drop that baby way down. Yes, it'll hurt more when you fall, if you fall, because you have that much more slack to hit the tree, but it's totally out of the way. Because the last thing you want to do is cam a platform over onto your rope or secure it and have the rope caught in it. Or So I just totally loosen up, drape it down out of the way. You know, or you could go up higher, but it's a lot easier as you're climbing to keep your line low, like, you know, almost down at your fives. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And so for me, like never having done, done that and then saying, okay, well, I'll just use the thing on my top stick. Oh, this yeah. is the easiest thing ever. Right. It and works, so, right. It, what's that? It works for you. So why yeah. You, right. Yeah. But then sw switching to the, the wingman, it's, it's a little bit deeper than this and you can stand up on it. And so I was kind of having that same issue and it was on a stick. So the one top stick problem that I have is inevitably there's a branch right there where I want to be. And so now instead of having to move, you know, what an eight inch post here, now I've got 20 inches or 17 inches where I have to maneuver it. And that's all dependent on arguably the most important part of the system is like where I'm going to stand for the next four to 12 hours. Right. right? And so all the work that it took to get up there to in the tree, now I'm like, well, it's it lands right on a knot, it lands on a branch, everything's wrong. So now I got to completely reevaluate. So I see the value of, of a platform. And so setting this one up at height, um, because it's not as deep, I didn't have as many issues like that. And I like the fact, I don't know if any of Matt's other ones have a folding standoff like this. I like that for, for carrying into the woods. I've been, uh, I've got it on a plateau pack and I've just been setting it on the top. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things within our Patreon group, we've been talking about like, where are you, how are you carrying your platform up the tree? You know, how, where are you, are you clipping it on? Are you, you know, what are you doing? But, you know, even with your sticks, like those standoffs are, you know, relatively sharp, you know, pointy, out objects so it's not always the best thing so that's one of the things i really did like about this and then we were talking about it's not on the standoff itself but actually on the platform how it's radius so it it bites and it doesn't have to be completely centered on the tree or like completely lined up to actually really get in there and get a good solid bite so those are some things that i i really like about it like the this one seems like it could be one for me for, from a non-platform guy. Right. And that was my biggest thing is if I'm going to sell a platform. It's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be rock solid. Like it, I'll climb with my steps. Say I'm screaming up a tree. I'm not, as I'm climbing up and mobily hunting, going up and going to take them down. I'm not worried about getting those steps perfect as I'm climbing. Say I jump on them and, you know, they may shift a little bit. I wasn't so concerned getting them perfect it's whatever because they're not going anywhere but the second i get to my platform configuration those are gonna i will take i'll take more time on my platform making sure it's perfect than climbing so you're not going to kill a deer climbing a tree you're going to kill a deer sitting in the tree so that's i'll spend a lot of time making sure it's perfect and that's the beauty about a little platform and steps i'll jump up like i think i'm going to be my feet are going to be that height you jump up there you look around you're like nope i either got to go down or up so boom you know two steps boom i got to go up six inches Boom, hop up, that looks good. You know, just the ability to move and make little micro adjustments is, can go a long way. So I, I think it's perhaps the most overrated thing in mobile hunting, hunting, uh, but it is does have some merit, I suppose. But what does this platform weigh? Just for for the guys that want to know it is uh it's depending on uh it, it'll vary by a couple ounces but it's 3.6 ounces okay because that's when you you know when you're talking about the the xl platform thing and i mean again uh, we we talked about this before like i think trophy line and the way that they do things that they're 
marketability is incredible but like you know uh, tethered had their platform you had yours and matt had the ridge runner and then there was another one uh, cool. before it. but uh then trophy line came out with theirs and rather than come out with one that was the same size as everybody else's they came out with their mission platform which is huge and the thing's like if it's not over five pounds it's it's right there and it's like guys go and they think that they're going to go saddle hunting and it's going to be way lighter and but they want this giant platform and then they got to figure out how to get up the tree now and then as they go back in their mind and they got to carry all these ropes and these all this this things that maybe they do or don't need um you know because of the industry or you know the saddle hunter forum or saddle hunter pages on facebook say these are all the things that you need and they're set up ways more than they were using with their climber so it it's like a, a double-edged sword like for me it's all about the bulk like it's right. my climber is I, I just moved one in my father-in-law's garage yesterday and it's this big and with the cables coming off of it i mean it's three feet long and i'm just like i don't care how much that weighs that is right so monstrous but it, you know so for the weight guys you know this is pretty much on par with a regular a, a standard size platform i say yeah yeah and it's like you know the the joke is i always make the joke guys want to climb a tree with dental floss and toothpicks um, the super lightweight guys, but in my mentality is I, I'm focused on maneuverability, packability, and simplicity. I mean, I want a compact system that's not in the way. It's on my back. Whether I'm going into an area and scouting and may hunt or I'm just scouting, I have, I, you know, yeah, I can feel it. It's back there, but it's not getting in the way. And when I need it, boom, it's right there. Because a lot of spots at Hunlong River, I'm not walking. I'm crawling through all the pucker and the frag and you know, you're getting wet, you're getting muddy, you're smacking against shit. You're literally pushing through prickers that just, if you go the wrong way, it stops you like a wall. So if I had climbing sticks, there's no way in hell I'm getting through there. Um, that's where I that was in the beginning of saddle hunting. I found this spot. I'm like, if you ain't getting a tree stand on a kayak into this spot, that's when saddle hunting made sense. But yeah, just to have a compact system that's out of the way and, you know, it just makes moving through the woods easier. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we kind of went through everything I wanted to talk about. I don't think it was a too bad of a conversation with, you know, guy with the reputation for being an asshole. So I think it's, <laughs> I think it's pretty like, good. Um, the girls have the RBF resting bitch face. Mm -hmm. the resting big face, I guess. <laughs> so, um, so if guys want to check out the saddle or, you know, the platform, any of that stuff, um, are you going to any shows? Are you going to be anywhere between here and the season? And then beyond that, like, you know, where can they check out the stuff or um, reach out to you? I'll be in Ohio at the Mobile Hunter Expo end of this month, 29th to 31st. After that, we'll go to Huntstock in Massachusetts. It'll be a good show. Um, and then I think the next one after that will be first year of the show, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Great American Outdoor Show. Um, you can find anything on wildedgeinc.com or any social media, Wild Edge, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. So we're all over. And any questions, you call our office phone. It's directed to my cell phone. You're talking to me. We don't have a little old lady sitting here doing customer service. <laughs> no, it's me. So. Well, awesome, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, dude. Yeah.